Bienvenue, bonjour tout le monde. Thank you everyone so much for coming to the 57th event of Dis Disrupting Disruptions, the Feminist and Accessible Publishing, Communications and Technology Speaker and Workshop Series. I'm Dr. Alex Ketchum and I'm a professor of feminist and social justice studies at McGill and the organizer of this series. The Feminist and Accessible Publishing, Communications and Tech Speaker and Workshop Series seeks to bring together scholars, creators and people in industry working at the intersections of digital humanities, computer science, feminist studies, disability studies, communication studies, LGBTQ studies, history, and critical race theory. I'm so excited to welcome you all to this event in fall 2022. On Saturday, Dr. Stephanie Duguay and I are speaking at Le Guillon on queer women's communication networks. And next week on September 29th, Dr. Sophie Tubin and Nina Morena are talking about activist knowledge production and circulation related to AI, big data, and digital tech. That will be a hybrid event. It'll be in person at McGill and also live streamed. You can find our full schedule as well as video recordings of past events at disruptingdisruptions.com. So that's the redirect URL, disruptingdisruptions.com. The other URL is way too long to remember. You can also find our list of sponsors, including Shirk, Milieu, Mila, Rakesh, and more. So today we have a Q&A option available. So throughout the event, you may type your questions in the Q&A answer box at the bottom of your screen. And there'll be some time during the second part of the event for Dr. Catherine Knight Steele to answer them. We can't guarantee that every question will be answered, but we are grateful for the discussion that you generate. Thank you today for our captioner, Dalton. As we welcome you into our homes and our offices to resume and you welcome us into yours, let us be mindful of space and place. Past series speakers, Suzanne Kite and Jess McLean have pointed to the physical and material impacts of the digital world. While the events this semester are virtual, everything that we do is tied to the land and the space that we are on. We must always be mindful of the lands that the servers enabling our virtual events are on. Furthermore, as the series seeks to draw attention to power relations that have been invisibilized, it's important to acknowledge Canada's long colonial history and current political practices. So this series is affiliated with the Institute for Gender, Sexuality, and Feminist Studies of McGill University. McGill is located in Jujogue, Montreal, on unceded Ganyangahaga territory. Furthermore, the ongoing organizing efforts by Indigenous communities, such as the West Wodan people at the Inistodan camp, water protectors, and people involved in the land back movements, make clear the ever-present and ongoing colonial violence in Canada. Interwoven with this history of colonization is one of enslavement and racism. This university's namesake, James McGill, enslaved Black and Indigenous peoples. It was in part from the money he acquired through these violent acts that McGill University was founded. These histories are here with us in this space and inform the conversations we have today. As past series speaker, Dr. Max Liberon wrote in their book, Pollutionist Colonialism, to change colonial land relations and enact other types of land relations, it requires specificity. I encourage you to learn more about the lands that you are on. Nativeland.ca is a fantastic resource for beginning. So now for today's event, Dr. Catherine Knight Steele is an associate professor of communication at the University of Maryland College Park, where she serves as the director of the Black Communication and Technology Lab, which is funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and part of the DISCO network. She also directs her university's digital studies in the Arts and Humanities Graduate Certificate. Her research focus is race, gender, and media, specifically focusing on Black culture, discourse, and digital communication. Dr. Steele's book, Digital Black Feminism traces the long history of Black women's relationship with technology and builds on her research into Black blogosphere of the early 2000s, pointing us towards both caution and optimism about the future of digital technology. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Catherine Knight Steele, and I'm so excited for this event. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. And um, thank you for the invitation to be here. It's always genuinely wonderful when folks <laughs> invite you to talk about a project that you spend so much time on. Um, I never want to take that opportunity for granted to be in conversation and community. Um, and I always begin my talks by thanking the folks who make it possible for these kinds of talks to happen. Um, first, the organizers of these events, but then also the folks who do labor that often is unseen and unthanked. The folks who do things like making sure the tech runs, making sure our labs and offices are cleaned, making sure that we're able to get to and from campus safely, 
making sure that there's captioning at our events so that folks are able to access them. Uh, so I'm incredibly grateful for all the folks whose labor goes into events like this. It is incumbent upon us to be in solidarity with folks whose labor is often maligned or not considered as a part of the way that institutions pay and consider our work. And so I am just eternally grateful for all the folks who, uh, who make these events possible. I'm gonna go ahead and, and share a screen here and do a little bit of talking about this digital black feminism thing that, uh, that I really am grateful to, to be here to talk about today. Uh, writing this book was, a long labor of love. Um, and it was um, actually, I was talking to a student the other day and they were starting their, not a student, a former student, I'm sorry, who is now a professor. It's weird to make that transition. And uh, she was discussing, you know, how she's beginning to turn her dissertation into a book and the kind of grinding gruel of that. And I said, yeah, you know, there is that. There's a lot of moments of writing a book that is that just are terrible. Um, <laughs> but also they're really delightful moments. And um, I really enjoyed actually a lot of the process of writing this. And one of the great delights for me, and I would say also perhaps surprises for me in writing this book are the ways that I get to move through histories, through the present moment and through conversations and considerations about the future. So I'd maybe like to set up the talk today by thinking through those three elements, the past, present, and future. Um, and in thinking about the past, I'd like to talk about how this idea of a Black feminist techno culture helps us do some work in reframing parts of our history. The first piece of our history that I think I try to work through in this text is, um, what exactly is a technology? Um, the second one is, how we come to understand what is technological expertise. And finally, it is the notion of what an expert and what expertise actually gets to look like. And I ask folks when I talk about these ideas to just sit for a moment and think about these questions in your own life and your own experience. When I say the term technology, can you reflect upon what when that term first started having meaning for you in your life? Where did you learn what a technology was? Was it in a textbook? Was it from a parent? Was it on a television show? How did you come to have some semblance of understanding of what would constitute a technology? Uh, who would be centered in our ideas of who creates new technologies? And what assumptions are built into our normative ideas about what a technology is and who holds technological expertise. A definition that I use for technology is the sum of techniques, skills, methods, processes that are used in the production of goods, services, or ideas toward the accomplishment of an objective. It's a useful definition, I think, but it falls short in a lot of ways. It holds contradictions in some ways, and it has some of those assumptions still built in. I try to work through some of this idea of defining new terms and finding the problems with the current terms we have as a practical mechanism of sharing a sense of uh, a beginning point with an audience, with a set of readers, but also as a strategy for holding myself and holding all of us accountable for what kind of assumptions we bake into ideas that we don't actually place at the center of our work but use as the foundation upon which we build more research about digital technology and tools. I was visiting a student, uh, a graduate seminar uh, a few months back and one of the students uh, who had read the book said, you know, you do a lot of operationalizing of terms in this book. And I hadn't thought about it, but they're right. Um, and I completely blame or thank, depending on which one you think is, is uh, Dr. Andy Rejecki, whose class I was in at the University of Illinois Chicago, because I think all we did in that class for an entire semester was operationalized terms. Every time I wanted to use a term in that class, the pushback was, and what does that mean? And what's the history of that term? And how do we come to understand that term? And so thank you, Andy, for that. Um, it actually does help quite a bit later in life. Um, and it helps for me to break down this notion of technology for two reasons. One is to, as I said, make sure we're on the same page. Are we actually talking about the same things when we say the term technology? But two, to actually figure out the ways that those systems of 
of uh, creating the notion of technology actually do some core work that we may not be aware that they're doing. Um, Dr. Patricia Hill Collins says that there is a shadow that is obscuring the complex Black women's intellectual tradition, and it is neither accidental nor benign. I would suggest that the way that we've come to define technology to the exclusion of a lot of people is also near not accidental nor benign, that there is a real long history as to how and why this has happened. For most of the US's short 300 year history, the master narrative has been about American efficiency, about American progress, about democracy. And in all of those ways, there has been the intentional removal of marginalized groups' lives and experiences. There's been the intentional removal of a written record that is kept and maintained by Black women. And without that written record kept and maintained by Black women about Black women, we have to examine the use of technology between the lines of the historical record. So I set out to do that in this text by trying to first locate a space within a US context that Black women actually were purveyors of technology without the watchful eye of the dominant group. A place where technologies were used exclusively on for Black women, where Black women were actually sought out and sought after and respected for their expertise. And I think we need to begin with this space because perhaps it's the only way that we can start to recognize Black women's expertise elsewhere is to start with a place that is actually about Black women. So we have to remove this blinder, this lens that's caused us to erase Black women from our conception of technology, from skill, from expertise. We have to undo the assumed deficiency and ineptitude that's been bestowed upon Black women as it relates to technology, while simultaneously questioning the inexplicable magic that's been laid at our feet as well. I just want to say I, I was a big fan of the term Black Girl Magic. I had the t-shirt as well. But the piece of Black Girl Magic that for me now, I want us to make sure we pay attention to are ways that that term or that idea of magic actually removes our humanity and our skillfulness in really intentional ways often. So where do I locate this space? For me, this space happens in the beauty shop. I build this analytic of a beauty shop to provide us a new lens through which to understand the layered complexity of Black feminist technoculture. Now, Brock labels cyber culture as, uh, Andre Brock labels cyber culture as the digital practice and artifacts that are informed by Black aesthetics. He differentiates um, Black cyber culture from white technoculture, defining the latter as a combination of whiteness and modern technological beliefs and argues that black cyber culture, unlike white technoculture, arises out of the aesthetic and the libidinal spaces. Black cyber culture for Brock is reflecting black folks' ability to interject pleasure and joy into technology from a black experience, a black experience that's too often considered only for its relationship to pain and deprivation. So this is a really critical interjection because it's asking us to consider how Black folks' unique experiences are transposed into their relationship with technology. I think it's a valuable starting point for us to think about uh, extricating Black cultural production from white cyber culture. In the text here, what I try to do is build upon this logic by asserting that perhaps it's Black digital Black feminism that is uniquely suited to undercut the reach and the power of white men's cyber culture. That black women's unique experience with oppression and resistance shapes our ability to both understand communication technologies that are analog and digital. Because if, as Brock argues, white cyber culture is built on white ideology, on patriarchy, on misogyny, then black feminist technoculture would be its undoing. It requires us to centralize Black women within the idea of Black cyber culture even, not as a periphery or an unnamed portion. Because when we ultimately view Black feminist technoculture without comparison to white technoculture or Black men's cyber culture, these boxes of patriarchy and white supremacy can no longer constrict our potentials. All right, so the, the beauty shop, let's focus on three affordances of this space, both in analog and digital form. And I'll explain how I build this then as a tool of theory, if you will, of Black feminist technoculture. 
The first piece here is that the focus on a virtual beauty shop or on a beauty shop more broadly reminds us to recenter Black women in our telling of feminist histories. It reminds us that Black feminism is not reactive to white feminism. I don't know how many of you in your graduate and undergraduate seminars when learning about multiple waves of feminism found out that at some point Black women said, hey, include us too. And thus Black feminism was born. I'm here to tell you that's not quite right. Black feminists were fighting for their freedoms far before the history books tell us that they were. Before, in fact, white feminists began fighting for voting rights or the right to work, Black women, as Toni Morrison writes, had nothing to fall back on, not maleness, not whiteness, not ladyhood, not anything. And out of the profound desolation of her reality, she may well have invented herself. So unlike white women suffragists, who sought to prove their strength and their viability in a world of men. Black women had already proven those inherent strengths through the callousness of chattel slavery, both physical and psychological. They had already undergone a baptism of fire and they had emerged intact. So Black women in the early parts of the Americas were fighting in, through insurgent actions as enslaved women. They were simultaneously fighting white slaveholders for their freedom while caring, attending to, and asserting agency in their homes with Black men. Black enslaved women were fighting white supremacy through their love for each other, through community. Race women, as Brittany Cooper explains, were ingeniously crafting rhetorical strategies uh, that asserted their freedom in publics. And this freedom was not rooted in a desire to wield power taken from Black men or from white women. Instead, the aim of Black feminist work has always been, from early colonial times to the present, is a revolutionary, emancipatory freedom, free from the confines of hegemonic power divides. So I take the beauty shop as a space, as a moment where Black women are talking to each other, about each other, working for each other, for themselves. It does not start with white women's history. The beauty shop allows us to begin with black women as the center point rather than a periphery figure. And that's why I begin with the beauty shop. It helps us to recenter. It also helps us to focus on this activity of just doing hair. Black hair care as a technology itself. If we look within the long histories of black hair care, we see things like braids and weaves and many other strategies of doing one's hair that can only be classified, if we're honest with ourselves, as extensive technological skill sets. Ways that Black women figured out through the use of multiple products that they mostly created themselves, how to keep themselves either in certain states of uh, aesthetic beauty for the view of whiteness or how to resist against them how to do both of those things, how to learn the skills necessary for survival and for preservation of culture while participating in acts of survival that required us to change and modify ourselves in the presence of others. And while those ideas can be taken up, they can be appropriated, they ultimately at their core belonged to Black women. I'm not one who usually puts long texts on slides as you might have noticed so far, but there is this quote that I really quite love from Andrea Rose Clark, who writes about braiding as a technology with a rule structure like an algorithm. And I'm just gonna read it. It says, design and fabrication tools perform aesthetic gestures based preset commands and algorithms. The execution and repetition of series procedures produces the patterns we see as braids. It's this closed system of rules that allows for variable patterns to evolve in a manner akin to the precision of laser cutting, burning and etching images into the material, the braider maps and parts the hair in preparation for plating a series of cornrows. The sectioning of the hair is done with mathematical understanding. Speed and efficiency are criteria that a braider will be judged by. Sophisticated calculations must occur at multiple points during a braiding session. These almost instantaneous and seemingly intuitive decisions allow for even distribution of braids across the three-dimensional surface of the head. Clark is arguing that braiding itself is the technology. It is the space where Black women's expertise can be readily seen, at least one facet of it. Natrice Gaskins goes on to explain how these patterns that seem so easy, that seem so simple, simple to repeat, simple to simulate, that process of braiding and weaving and knitting 
is actually about the complexity that arises out of that perceived simplicity. That making something look that easy actually shows the level of expertise necessary to achieve that end. We could go through a variety of Black women's hair care strategies, inventions, and technologies to think about how the beauty shop created a space for Black women to be both inventive and creative, and to do so in ways that benefited themselves. One of the ways that that hair care technology benefits Black women is through notions of entrepreneurship, and that's actually a great lens for us to think about the metaphor between analog and digital culture. Black women's beauty shops were developed in their homes often, around their kitchen tables, because they didn't have access to the same kinds of funding and resources that small businesses did in the United States during that period of time. While folks were getting small business loans, getting helps from banks, Black women were creating their businesses on their own, using their own marketing and branding strategies to keep a successful shop going. They were doing this often in Black neighborhoods and primarily with Black consumers. And it was mostly Black women who were benefiting from this practice. We can see that transference to online spaces where Black women create their own blogs, create their own websites, create their own sites of discourse in order to preserve conversation among other Black women. That they're doing this very often without having taken one class in social media marketing or branding, without having attended any graduate seminars on persuasive audience construction. They're doing this because they have learned and passed down how to pass on these levels of expertise one to another, how to make money by doing these things that they have learned skill sets for. And I'll talk a little bit later about what it means to actually make money setting up sites to talk about Black feminist thought. But the last reason, last rationale why, why I begin with the beauty shop, why I begin with that as a place that we should pay attention to is about thinking about the beauty shop as an enclave space. I study Black women's culture online as sites of enclave. Uh, I gather that terminology from the work of Catherine Squires. So if we start at kind of where this begins, we can go back to Jürgen Habermas, who talks about a public sphere, a place where people gather to debate and to construct democratic ideals, a place that is free in Habermas's notion from the ideas of hierarchy, where everyone can participate openly and have the same access. Now, Nancy Fraser then reminds all of us that that actually isn't, wasn't, and never will be the case. <laughs> that all of these supposed publics that existed had measures through which people had to pass in order to participate. They had to be landowners, they had to be men. Uh, and, and it wasn't that folks who weren't these landowning men didn't have ideas, didn't debate, didn't think through concepts together. They just did it in what Fraser calls subaltern counterpublics. But what Catherine Squires provides us is an even more extensive way to think about how and why people gather, both offline and on, that our goals are not always to debate. Our goals are not always to be in conversation with the dominant group or to gain access to the dominant group. In fact, we have these sites called enclaves and satellite publics, where people have either chosen to leave the dominant group or been forced out. And in these enclaves, as she describes it, marginalized groups gather for the purpose of survival. They withhold their discourse and their discussion from the dominant group. They strategize together quietly in the cracks and crevices of digital culture and offline culture in order to keep themselves alive. If we think about the discursive space of the beauty shop as an enclave, it is a space that requires high context for participation, that features internal ways of knowing where rule structures aren't written down on the wall where emotions can be validated through conversation, where accountability is a requirement for people to participate, and where narrative tends to rise to the top versus debate. Catherine Squires gives us an articulation of why Black women's spaces as enclaves are valuable sites for us to look at, whether they exist in the physical structures of a beauty shop or in the corners of the blogosphere or TikTok. So how do we take what is, I think, a somewhat useful metaphor and bring in some theory to help us think through this Black feminist technoculture. I draw from the work of three Black women, Patricia Hill Collins, Joan Morgan, and Anna Everett, who together helped me construct what I call Black feminist technoculture. Patricia Hill Collins gives us so very much, but in this context, I'm talking about her use of the term matrix of domination. Now, many of us, if not most, are more familiar with the idea of intersectionality, given that term coined by Kimberly Crenshaw. 
And intersectionality is a really useful term. It's a bad, it has a really useful long trajectory, but I find myself continually drawn back to the terminology matrix of domination. I like this term for a couple of reasons. One, it's really hard to appropriate the term matrix of domination. You can't take it and mean some, make it mean something that it doesn't actually mean. You're gonna have to deal with power if you're gonna call something the matrix of domination. It can't just be about your identity, which is what's happened in lots of ways to the term intersectionality. But I also like this uh, notion of a matrix because a matrix requires us to consider the environment in which oppression development develops, the, uh, the structure of that inequality, the complicated ways that systems surround the lives of Black women, but it also contains these multiple elements that aren't immediately visible, elements that are interconnected and reliant on each other to make meaning of a larger whole. The matrix, though, also shows us the cracks that exist within such a system. So Collins's matrix of domination provides us first the context necessary to understand the multiple oppression forces, but also the optimism necessary to understand how those multiple oppressive forces can be cracked and broken. This provides us, I think, a really good foundation through which to take up digital culture, which I think very brilliantly hides its oppressive forces very frequently. The second piece of this is Joan Morgan's uh, hip hop feminism and specifically Joan Morgan's Shades of Grey. Joan Morgan's book is my favorite book from my undergraduate years. It is the book that introduced me to hip hop feminism and introduced me to a brand of feminism that actually made sense for me at the time. Morgan was bringing forward hip hop feminism to require Black feminists to get more comfortable in the state of contradiction. She argues for a Black feminist thought that, as she puts it, fucks with the grays. How can one love hip hop, be shaped by hip hop, and yet vociferously push back against the misogynoir that's embedded at much of its core? Hip hop feminism provides us a roadmap for what I'm talking about, which are women who grew up in digital spaces, whose ways of writing, whose relationship to pop culture, who first read about feminist thought online. And yet those same online spaces are where they face some of the most awful harassment and violence that they encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. Digital culture, like hip hop, simultaneously holds the harms and the victories, the possibilities for entrepreneurship and the ways that people appropriate style, culture, and art. So being a black feminist online necessitates effing with the grays, to quote Joan Morgan. The last piece here is Anna Everett's Black Technophilia, which was a book far ahead of its time. Uh, Anna Everett writes about redirecting the public from an almost obsession with Black deviance as it relates to technology and, black te and technophobia to talking about Black technophilia, or the idea that Black folks aren't deficient in our technology use, are instead technophilic. We are vanguards. Andre Brock refers to this as a natural affinity Ray Fouché talks about how Black folks exhibit Black vernacular technological creativity. What Anna Everett is ultimately giving us um, with this notion of Black technophilia is a new lens through which to examine Black folks and specifically Black women's use of technology without deviance, without deficiency, instead beginning with the premise that what we do is creative. It's more than magical, it's skillful, and it's expertise. So walking through this past, if you will, I think demonstrates why it's important for us to visit the gaps in the archive, to understand further how researchers of digital technology cannot begin their work with the taken for granted histories and assumptions about our tools. This focus on history reminds us that in order to become better researchers, we have to tune our gaze to those histories. We have to do that critical work of redefining, and we have to find new lenses through which to see the past that we always saw as stagnant or normal. These concepts lay the groundwork for the principles, the praxis, and the product of digital Black feminism. And they're the basis for my argument that there is indeed a Black feminist technoculture, that it has been present both in the United States and across the globe for centuries, and that that would point us toward a future of digital technology. So I'll shift my attention from the past to the present. And in the present, I wanna talk a little bit about methods. Not in a boring way, but in the most exciting methods way we possibly can. And thinking about what do we do ethically to actually study Black folks or and or other marginalized communities online. 
I moved in this book between empirical data analysis and critical cultural work and rhetorical criticism. And so we have to ask, how is it that archival work, I asked myself this to write the book, in fact, how can archival work and online data collection marry? Should we be applying similar strategies to deal with texts and data in the form of a correspondence written in the 1890s that we would to a tweet sent in 2019? I think any text that studies Black feminist technoculture has to situate the text historically and contextually. Hopefully we're doing that with all of our work. It has to be focused though, I would argue also on the people that use the tools rather than just the tools themselves. Black feminist technoculture asks us to think about the relationship that people form with their tools. And I think this method and this strategy has to see the artifacts that people leave behind as belonging to multiple genres of study. What we know to be true is that people are always producing different things online contextual space. So sometimes on Twitter, folks are producing media for mass consumption, but they're also using these same apps and channels to write direct messages to people they know offline. We're engaging in a sort of public address occasionally when we speak out into the ether. But we also use these same spaces to capture moments of our lives like we would in a diary or a metaphor. We're sometimes fashioning our own archive. How possibly can we have one tool or one approach uh, to studying all of these very different things that are happening at the same time. I would argue you need to combine some different strategies together, perhaps discursive analysis with studies of platforms, critical cultural work, rhetorical criticism, what some people might call digital ethnography. Uh, Andre Brock has a, a method that he calls critical technocultural discourse analysis that I think gets towards some of this. He wants to position technology as a cultural representation of our social structures and interrogate the relationship between culture and technology as permanently intertwined concepts. I would argue that to, in order to understand Black feminist technoculture, you as the researcher have to form a relationship with the idea of capture in the same way that the folks that we're studying have formed a relationship with that term. In the book Barracoon by Zora Neale Hurston, she interviews Kujo Lewis, who was one of the last remaining survivors of the transatlantic slave trade. In the 1927 interview, he details his capture and life in the U.S. that followed. Raised in Eatonville, Florida, Hurston travels back to her hometown across the South to capture Black life in the early part of the 20th century. In her autobiography, she captured pieces of her own life. The word capture here, you see, is always indicative of power. Who's in a position to do the capturing? What do they choose to capture? And ultimately, what becomes of the capturer? and the captured. Patricia Hill Collins' Matrix of Domination reminds us that the dominant group has a long-standing prerogative to control the capture and redistribution of images of Blackness and of Black life, Black women's lives. But still that activity of capturing, of curating, of making one's life available, making one's own words and images known, shows the complicated relationship that Black feminists have to have in this activity of capture in their praxis. So what's our relationship with capture as researchers? How does our work capture their moments, their histories, their words of the people that we're studying? While CTDA focuses on traditional technology as social media, we have to think about what happens when we apply these same concepts of looking at the interrelationship, the interpolation of user and tool to other kinds of media. What happens when we apply that to print documents and archival material like correspondence, if we transpose that same analytic structure into those spaces? CTDA asks us to focus on the dialogue that's happening on one platform in multiple ways. In the same way that when Anna Julia Penn in the 1800s, her letters to her friends are fundamentally different than letters she writes to her alma mater. We can see that, we can study that. We have to carry that same action over to our study of platforms like Instagram. Here I'll give you an example. Looking at the screen now, you see three different examples of how writer, blogger, comedian, technologist, Lovey Ajayi talks about her own wedding, how she talks about it on Instagram, how she talks about it on Facebook, how she talks about it on Twitter. These are very different imaginings of the same event. She is usual, utilizing her understanding of how platforms work how audiences shift between platforms and the different affordances that are possible on these platforms to tell a story of an event in three very different ways. Because I'm studying the spaces that folks leave, that uh, the, the folks create these texts leave behind as artifacts, 
I'm studying both the things that they say and the things that they do not say. To do this, I would argue you have to be there. You can't do this work well by capturing ideas uh, apart from their context. Each one of these posts happened on different days around the same time on different platforms by the same author. But there would be no way in my capture of this to link them together. There's not the same hashtag. There's not the same notion that they're talking about the same events, but for the fact that I knew she got married. I knew that because she kept posting about it. I also understood how she saw her audiences differently. In fact, her Instagram story very frequently referenced hashtags about her wedding. Why? Not because they were searchable, not because she was using that place to provide other folks access to it. It was Instagram stories after all. They were gonna disappear in 24 hours. She was using that for her own personal archive. But how do we know that beyond being there, beyond sitting in the barbershop like Melissa Harris Perry did in her book about barbershops? If I'm trying to track a lineage though of women who are no longer here to answer questions for me and more generative way to study the barbershop and beauty shop over time, I'm gonna have to apply some of these principles of studying digital technology now backward to the past. I need to treat the social media posts the way that I somewhat treat the memoirs and letters and diaries of black women who left these for us some 100 years ago. In either and in both case, I think it requires an ethic of care for the texts and the people who create them and read them. For all the blogs I study, I was there when they first happened. I read them the day that they happened. I saw the comments as they were posted. I knew when tweets were posted and when they were deleted. I knew when tweets happened in response to something that happened that day in the news. That's the level of time and care we can also bring to our historical research as digital scholars as well. While I can't be there while Anna Julia Cooper writes a letter to Oberlin College, I can treat her words like they require context and I can go and seek out that context. I can also lose myself so deeply in the pages and pages of letters and documents I find in the archive that I forget the question I set out to answer and instead I'm required to get to know the person that's responsible for creating them. All right, we've talked quite a bit now about the past and of the present and I'd like to leave us with a short talk about the future. In thinking about the future, I wanna think about the lessons that this black feminist techno culture gives us about both the possibilities and constraints on our current digital cultural context. And I wanna do that by talking about pizza. Akila Hughes, a comedian who posted a video in 2015, created a video called Intersectionality Pizza. In this pizza, she described men as burgers and women as pizza with cheese pizza being the stand-in for white women and deluxe pizza being the stand-in for black women. She described black women's exclusion from mainstream white feminist causes. She described the additional burdens that black women face as they advocate for their freedom, but she did so by lightheartedly discussing pizza toppings. The video went viral and it was reposted on tons of blogs and even shared on cable news networks. It seemed like she was really onto something because the video was packaged in a way that held the attention of a public that, let's face it, is increasingly used to consuming only short content and digestible bites. It took material that is really challenging and made it easy to understand, and it did it without alienating any viewers. I'm sure many of you know, Americans love pizza. We love burgers. And pizza and burgers, unlike the people that they were to represent, don't hold any responsibility for how their existence impacts the existence of others. So when these digital videos and hashtags emerge that package complex theory into bite-sized chunks that students will pay attention to, it's tempting to embrace and even encourage their use because intersectionality pizza provides a really attractive metaphor. But buzzwords and viral video content don't give us the tools necessary for in-depth critical analysis. I think the case is that a medium of mass communication like a digital platform can package and does package the ideas of Black feminism for sale. However, in this commodification process, what we're getting ultimately is superficial access to complex theories that results in a more watered down product that's palatable to the broadest possible audience. What's more though, and what's actually a little bit scary about this is when we take these commodification of ideas and critical concepts, and lead to the commodification of actual people. I trace in the book how this happens with celebrities like Cardi B 
how the societal push towards prototyping or trying on the bodies and ideas of other folks is actually made possible in large contexts by the affordances of our digital platforms. Sites like TikTok that I didn't get to write about in the book, in fact, require this mimicry and appropriation in order for our participation. And we have to really think about what it means for folks to take on these new ways of commodifying both themselves and their own ideas in a digital context. I always hate to finish on such a downer while we think about the possibilities of Black feminist culture, the wide array of ways that it allows us to think about histories and presents and futures by warning us about what could possibly become of digital Black feminism if not kept in check, about how capitalism at its core always corrupts. But I guess that is kind of the way that I'm going to finish for now, because I do want us to think very carefully about expressions like listen to Black women, follow Black women, ask Black women, and what that can lead to if we're not actually doing the work and the labor of going back and thinking about what the long arc of listening to Black women would tell us about our particular social and political context and the kinds of ways that listening to Black women over our long history could give us really valuable lessons about our digital future. So I thank you so much for hanging out with me and letting me talk to you a little bit about what I've written. And I really look forward to having a conversation now with some great questions about uh, what's to come or what possibilities we can think about uh, one thing I'll say really quickly is please follow me on Twitter. I'd love to keep the conversations going after this. And you can also follow my lab, the BCAT lab at BCAT underscore disco if you want to keep in touch with how so many wonderful students are thinking about possibilities that I could have never imagined uh, when I was writing this text. So thanks so much. Thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation. For folks that are attending, I welcome you to write questions into the Q&A box below and we'll read them aloud for uh, Dr. Nate Steele to answer them. Uh, I have a question to maybe uh, get us going a bit. It goes along with kind of what you left us on with this idea of um, commodification. And I was really drawn to the fourth chapter of your book when you're talking about Mavis Beacon and the way that her image becomes commodified. And I was wondering if you can speak more to how digital black feminism provides your framework provides tools in which to better understand uh, this challenge of when others commodify Black women's images for digital technologies versus the way that Black women are using their own images to resist this commodification. Thanks so much for that question. Um, I'll give a little backdrop for those who haven't had the chance to, to read the text. I, I talk quite a bit in the beginning of that fourth chapter about my relationship with Mavis Beacon. And for those who don't know, if this was before your time, Mavis Beacon taught me to type. Mavis Beacon was the name of type, uh, teaching typing software that emerged uh, decades ago, that many of us sat either at our computers or our word processors to learn how to type from uh, who we thought of as Mavis Beacon, who was a black woman who was featured on the cover of all of these CD-ROM cases. Um, Mavis Beacon doesn't exist in actuality. Uh, Mavis Beacon was the imagination of the software developer and the woman whose face we looked at and thought of as Mavis Beacon was a model that was hired to play that role. And I write about how that's such an, I kind of in passing, how that's kind of an interesting metaphor for how we think about black women's contribution to digital spaces. How there are actual factual ways that we could look at black women as typists, as technologists, and those could have been the heroines of my youth. <laughs> they could have been the folks who were teaching me about the importance of computing. Um, but instead, what I was drawn to and what I had access to was an image of a Black woman that was constructed through the mind of someone else. And that that image of a Black woman was used to sell typing software to an entire country and global society, right? Um, and so the question asks, what do we do with this idea that there are so many ideas and thoughts and words of Black women that get picked up and get commodified? How do we make sense of a digital space that's constantly taking from Black culture and specifically from Black women, while also acknowledging that there are Black women who are utilizing that space toward the pursuit of freedom? I wanna also say that there are Black women who are using that space just to have fun. There are Black women who are using that space just to exist in their own bodies. And I think what the beauty of what Black feminist thought, and I would say specifically what digital Black feminism does for me, 
is help us think about the complexity and to be comfortable in the state of contradictions, to understand that digital culture is gonna do both. Uh, it's always gonna do both. And that every technology, by the way, historically has always done both. So I trace some technologies that were either invented by or pursued by Black women in some of the early chapters here and think about how some of the same technologies that were intended as sites of oppression were also turned on their heel by Black women in order to pursue their own freedom. If we think about hair care as one of those, I think that's a really excellent example. We talk about pressing hair and perms and um, sewing in of other hair cultural patterns, right? And the relationship that these ideas have with notions of colorism, of appropriation, right? But also how they are a form of agen agency on the part of Black women, how we have to be able to hold both of those truths at the same time. I think what Black women teach us very brilliantly about digital technology is how to take up the tools that maybe were intended to do one thing and use them to do something else. I think about this every time when Black Twitter begins telling jokes about some cultural event of the day. And those used to be really private moments that no one knew about, but now they end up on CNN by the end of the day, right? And so everybody sees all of the signifying practice and the joke telling and the extensive metaphors that are used on Black Twitter. And I think about how the hashtag was originally uh, understood, what it should do, how it would operate. And then what Black folks did with that hashtag that changed the whole tool itself. It changed mainstream culture's interaction with spaces like Instagram and Twitter and Reddit. And it did that not as a mechanism of intentional resistance, but as a mechanism of living our full lives in public without concern for who's watching. And I, I think that that's just as important as marking when we use tools for resistance is to mark when we use tools simply to exist. Um, and there's power in our existence and in our joy and our pleasure in those spaces as much as there is in our resistance strategies. Thank you so much. And while you were speaking, we also got some audience questions. Uh, so I'll read one from an anonymous attendee who writes, what was the process of writing the book and getting it out there like for you? Did you encounter any obstacles in terms of getting your voice to be heard? Oh, that's a lovely question. Thank you for that. Um, this book was a long process. <laughs> um, for those who are in graduate school and are writing dissertations and are planning on turning them into books, that's smart. That's not what I did. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I didn't turn my dissertation into a book. So this was a book that the idea came out of while I was writing my dissertation. But if I'm really honest, and there's versions of a talk that I do where I think about what the origin of this book was and I trace it either to um, graduate school or I trace it to Mavis Beacon <laughs> or I trace it to conversations I was having when I was working full time and finding myself lost in the blogosphere because the folks around me didn't look like me or have the same cultural reference points that I did and I needed a space to escape. There are a ton of ways that this book kind of came to be out of a sense of longing for someone to tell the story of all of these little Black girls who didn't maybe code, but knew an awful lot about technology. And I decided after I wrote my dissertation, which was about the Black blogosphere, but which didn't focus on Black women, focused more broadly on Black folks online and was called the Digital Barbershop that I had done a disservice to the Black women that I primarily was studying there by not naming them in this document, by doing the same thing that so many people do, which is talk about Black folks as a monolith and pretend that Black women aren't a critical part or focus on the legacies and histories of Black women. And so that's what I decided I wanted to do in my book. But the honest truth about how this came together was that I had a pretty long delay in writing when I was doing administrative work for a grant called the African American Digital Humanities Program. And in doing that administrative work, as you'll find out, administrative work sometimes takes you away from writing. Um, but it took me away and it took me to other parts of the academy that I hadn't visited before. I got to sit with historians and archivists and folks who studied um, the long legacy of things, right? And this wasn't how my framework at that time operated for how you study digital culture. To me, if you're gonna study Twitter, you study Twitter. If you're gonna study blogs, you study blogs. But what I realized through that time was I always have been interested in the long legacy of things. I've always sought to see how folks offline behavior merged into their online behavior or how things we were taught by our parents became ways that we spoke later. 
Um, so the book came out of that desire to tell the story of what was going on with Black women and Black feminism right now, to write down that history as a moment in time that will be different in 10 years, undoubtedly, um, but that hopefully folks in 10 years will have something to look back on and continue to do that work of saying, this is where we were and here's how it grows into this other thing. Uh, in terms of resistance to the text, uh, I've gotten a lot of different kinds of you know, kind critique and pushback, and I've gotten some not as kind, of, but helpful all the same, because I think it's always useful to see how people are taking in the work. Um, some of the early reviews from my text asked me to focus more on that last portion, on, on capitalism and consumption, uh, to think very critically about that more and make that kind of the subtext of the book. And I chose not to do that. I, I appreciated that reviewer's comments but part of the reason I chose not to do that was that I felt, as I said early on, that so much of our story gets told through lenses of deficiency and deviance. And that it was very important for me to spend at least some of my chapters thinking about possibility, thinking about optimism, and the ways that Black women were constructing their own self-sufficient spaces that were really useful before I did the work of critically talking about what consumption does to those spaces. Because I think if we begin there, we're ignoring a history, we're ignoring what these digital spaces actually meant for these populations and how they changed the trajectory of digital technology in a lot of ways for the better. Um, so that was a little bit of the pushback. I mean, I also have gotten the standard kind of question from unnamed uh, older faculty members early in my career who would say, well, what are you gonna write about when this whole digital thing you know, is done? Uh, <laughs> that's not a real area of study. Um, and, and luckily, that's not been most people's response to it. I think most folks have, have been very generous uh, in their reading and in their conversation with me about this. And I found a lot of generosity in a lot of different areas that were kind of uh, not, not expected. So, Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I think Sarah's going to read the next question. Yeah, wonderful. So um, Chloe asks, could you reiterate your final warning that relates to the corruption of capitalism? Sure. Well, we can talk about this all day, right? Um, <laughs> I mean, so I spent a bit of time in the book talking about hypercapitalism, right? About how digital technology foments hypercapitalism, that everything is a commodity within digital society, right? That our brands, our bodies, ourselves, our words all become goods for sale. Um, and that, that's kind of the pro that's the product of capitalism broadly. But what digital culture allows for is for the everyday average person to turn everything we do into commodity, right? There's this idea that you don't have hab uh, hobbies anymore. You have, you know, second jobs. You, you know? So if you like sewing, then you should sell things that you've sewn, right? If, if you're, if you like, you know, romance novels, you should now provide critiques of romance novels that are advertiser based and you should get content, you know, you should post that content and you should get views and you should get likes for it and people should pay you for your thoughts about this thing. And there's part of me that really likes the idea that Black women are getting paid for their stuff, right? Because historically we haven't. And so there's something really brilliant for me in some of the blogs that I um, study. These were Black women who were writing in the early 2000s who were doing this as a hobby. They were doing it after work or on their lunch breaks who are now like New York Times bestselling authors who are now like hosting their own podcasts, who have their own companies, who are doing amazing work and are getting paid. And that's fantastic. Uh, and at the same time, it's a little bit scary um, to me that some of these places that we created for ourselves are not for us anymore, right? They are for sale to the highest bidder. And I watched, I traced in my book how some of the blogs that I studied went up for sale, went to um, larger companies and what happened to those enclave spaces when that occurred. But also, and I think that this is the part that was, I, I think most concerning to me is, is the piece about Cardi B in the book, right? So I, I picked somebody, gotta pick a person. And I wrote a bit about this idea that, of prototyping, of turning a human being into the product for sale, into something that we can try on. And I write about specifically how that can happen by other black women, how in our pursuit of better understanding our own feminism, we might try on the appearance or try on the ideas or try on the personage of another person. And that form of capitalism, that form of consumption is harmful to us and harmful to the people that we're doing it to. And I worry often about digital Black feminism and about Black feminist thought more broadly becoming a part of this hyper-capitalist superstructure 
where our ideas, our thoughts, and our bodies uh, become products for sale within a larger digital ecosystem. Thank you so much. Uh, the next question comes from Alex, who writes, alongside your book, what is some great material to read and content to consume to help us digest some of this material even more? Oh, um, so you might have heard me reference Andre Brock. I think that his book um, is friends with mine. <laughs> Sarah Florini also has a wonderful book called Beyond Hashtags that is just phenomenal. Um, let's see, um, Hashtag Activism by Sarah Jackson, Moya Bailey, uh, and Brooke Foucault-Wells, as well as Moya Bailey's book called Misogynoir Transformed would also be a great read to, uh, in, in conjunction here. Charles McElwain has a beautiful history of Black digital technology that works so well. And um, Kishana Gray's book uh, on gaming and game culture, I think also uh, are in conversation here. I'm missing a ton, but that's a couple places to start. <laughs> awesome, thanks so much. And to plug the series, Andre Brock and Moya Bailey spoke before and their video recordings are housed yeah, on our website. So you're awesome. Miss them out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Sarah, do you wanna? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the next question comes from an anonymous attendee who asks, do you think that phrases like black excellency are a good way to counteract the issues you mentioned with black girl magic? Or um, do you think part of the scholarly work to be done is finding some new phrases entirely? Mm, yeah, thank you for that question. You know, I think I'm, I'm often drawn to, because I'm a teacher and because I do a lot of public speaking, ways that we can truncate information into a short, you know, something <laughs> that kind of does the work. Like I like matrix of domination, right? Um, but what we notice is that like none of these phrases are gonna fully do the work of doing or undoing what we're trying to have done. And phrases like um, like black excellence, which often gets brought up. Uh, and, and I think like similarly in like a hashtag, right? We'll see like um, people in their graduation caps and gowns and hashtag black excellence, right? Or something like that. And I don't know when it was, but it was probably a couple of years ago I was at a, it was like the TMI moment for the talk. I was at a party, I think it was a Christmas party or something. And they were giving a toast at the end of it. And it was all black attendees there. And somebody goes, let's just give this toast real quick to black excellence. And I was like, huh? Like we're getting drunk on eggnog guys. <laughs> like, what are we talking about here? And I think the reason that it was, it stood out to me in that moment was it's the performance or the need to perform excellence for someone else that I was resistant to. And the idea that just being regular wasn't sufficient, that the blackness needed to be paired with excellence in order to be okay, right? And I don't know, I know that's not what folks mean. I know that, I, I, I'm, I'm very aware, but just like the way that a lot of folks don't mean anything by black girl magic, I'm always just kind of curious about how we separate ourselves from other folks. So like, this is black excellence and that's not and or spaces where excellence becomes this precursor to our humanity. Like we're worthy of being a part of this group, we're worthy of inquiry, we're worthy of things because we've achieved certain uh, societal ideas of what constitutes excellence. And so like, I do like that term in some contexts. I think it can be really helpful and motivating, right? For students, it can be motivating for folks, but also what it can do when left unchecked, like Black Girl Magic, is cause further separation, is cause further inclinations toward uh, some notion that some folks are more worthy or are, are, are better off and, and should be considered more fully as human beings than other folks. So I think we have to, yes, we have to think of maybe not new phrases, but we have to get more comfortable with nuance and complication and messiness, right? That like there are not going to be short, quick fixes to really complex problems. I mentioned Sarah Florini, but something she says all the time um, is that if white supremacy were such an easy fix, it wouldn't have lasted for so long, right? Like if patriarchy was such an easy thing to undo, it wouldn't still be around. It's the trickiness and the messiness and the complications of those kinds of ideas that require tricky, messy, complicated, long-term strategies and solutions. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, there's a few comments and kind of a question from an anonymous attendee. So I'm gonna to try to summarize some of this, but it's going along the topic of this discussion of excellence and fitting on. And one of the questions that comes from this, I hope I'm summarizing some of your comments okay to the anonymous person who wrote this, um, but maybe if you could speak a little bit more about this topic of fitting in and or fitting on, 
and um, what that means for safety signaling. Yeah, um, so you know, I didn't I didn't have the chance to talk a bunch about the Cardi B section of the book and the prototype thing. So I developed this idea of the prototype in the book and the way that we um, I'm talking specifically in the book about how being removed from perceptions of blackness. So in this case, I'm talking about like the middle class folks that I'm studying. I try to always name very specifically who I'm studying. When I'm studying the blogosphere of the early 2000s, I'm studying middle class black folks. I'm studying black folks who had some form of higher education and who had the leisure time to blog. That meant something different to be very clear in the year 2000 to the way you could interact online to now. There was not the smartphone. So you had to have access to a stable, internet connection, you had to have a desktop or laptop computer and you had to have the spare time during your work day, which means you had to have a certain kind of job to engage. Okay, so all that as a, as a, as a context point, that those folks who now, because they find themselves living in communities that are away from other black folks or having to engage in workplaces that are away from other black folks, have to do some trying on of blackness or think they have to do some trying on of blackness, right? To try to perform blackness so as to feel more connected to who they once were, who they still believe themselves to be. And the, the danger in that, the, the problem with that is that they're trying on real people's lives. So in the same way that we are up in arms when folks try on costumes of our culture and we're like, how dare you? We have to be really cognizant of the ways that we're doing that within our own culture. How are we turning the aesthetic of poor black women, of working class black women, of women of a certain economic means into an aesthetic? into something that can be bought and sold, right? How is it that middle-class Black folks in the area I live in regularly go to events called like trap karaoke while working federal government jobs that are three figures, right? And so that idea of the trap becomes a thing that we try on in order to see how it fits, to see how it informs our life, how it allows us to perform in certain ways or feel certain freedoms that we feel currently restricted to. So trying on can happen by a variety of groups, intergroup and intragroup. And I think it's important that we're cognizant of that and the way that digital technology not only affords that possibility, but as I said, promotes it in a lot of contexts. I'm continuously fascinated by how the whole premise of TikTok is trying on, right? Like as an audio mimetic site, right? Like the whole point is to take the sound of someone else on, is to take the verbal exercises or the facial expressions or the jokes of someone else on and to perform them. Um, and, and we're not saying that that's bad, right? I want to be really clear, but it's interesting that that's become a precursor for participation is the willingness to try on someone else. So it's, it's something for us to continue to think about as we create new technologies as well. Amazing. Um, thank you. I think this has gone in such an interesting direction. Um, and there's another question from Lois. I hope I'm pronouncing your name okay. Um, so they ask, I have a question about the last note you ended on. And this was a little, well, a few minutes before. Yeah. The idea of easily consumable taglines about intersectionality, for example. I was wondering, does it really do more harm than good? Mm -hmm. Or perhaps does it take the academia out of the concept and make it easily accessible for people who aren't necessarily in humanities? So some friends of mine have joked that my next tattoo should be just the, sent the, the words both and, because that's how I respond to everything, right? It is both this and that. And this is a, a place that I think that that's true, right? Um, I was really excited, I would say some years ago to watch the term intersectionality just like circulate in the common culture, right? Like, like random folks on Twitter are talking about intersectionality or talking about appropriation or like having the discussions that I was having in like these intro classes with my students who, you know, 10, 15 years ago when I started teaching, like they had not heard these terms. These were new to them. Now they're coming to class and they, I don't I know what intersectionality is. I know what appropriation is. That's good. It's good always when what happens inside the academy is made accessible outside, because that should be the goal in a lot of places, right? We don't theorize for theorizing sake, but so that some of that work actually reaches the places where it needs to go. All that said, um, there's been folks who have written about this much more eloquently than I, um, and I'll, I'll drop their, th that info on my Twitter account if anybody wants to follow up after. But, um, but what they've said about this and what I, I agree with is that 
terms like intersectionality can be taken, this can happen accidentally, where they become so widely circulated that they start to lose their meaning, that they mean everything and therefore mean nothing. So we watch folks use intersectionality as um, an adjective or as an adverb, right? That it's describing a thing, like this is an intersectional meeting. We're gonna have intersectional ideas here. This is an intersectional, right? cup. This is an intersectional hat, right? <laughs> and I'm an intersectional feminist, right? That all of these things become descriptors of identity because we've taken intersectionality to no longer be about power differentials in society that have a systemic root and need to be rooted out in order to break down hegemony. And instead, we've taken intersectionality to mean different people have different identities, right? And so I hear students instead coming to class saying, I know what intersectionality is. I'm a biker. And I, uh, this is my religion, and I have brown hair. Intersectionality, right? These are my identity groups, and we all are intersectional because we all have identities. And when we get to that place, right, where the original term has lost its meaning, it's come to take on something else in society. I'm not going to say it does more harm than good, but it's something for us to be attentive to. It's something for us to watch out for. Because as I started out this talk, Sometimes these things are intentional. They're not just accidents, all right? These are the consequences of bad actors who intentionally take terms that are powerful, take concepts that are used toward the process of liberation and water down the meaning so much that, they, that the larger public no longer has a concept of what it means. And I, I can use a different example beyond intersectionality. This has happened in the States with critical race theory over the last year, right? And that is a very intentional move of folks to take a term that has a real meaning, uh, to take an, a concept that has a real legacy, to take a theory, a theoretical construct that has years of dialogue and debate about it and reduce it to mean anytime we talk about race, it's bad right, that, that it's negative. And then they've taken that term and very intentionally, you could trace this, right? So I'm a communications guy, you can trace this in the text, how this is an intentional move to undermine the power of this concept and this construct. And so that's what I mean about intersectionality. We have to be careful about how terms can get undermined by our superficial attention to them. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question to follow up on what you were talking about with TikTok. Is yeah. that part of your new work or new projects that you're working on? Or yeah. are you focused primarily on starting the center right now, which it would also be great if you want to talk yeah. about that. <laughs> For sure. Um, I, I think I'm as obsessed with TikTok as the average person. I think <laughs> the pandemic, the pandemic did that to me. And I, and I said at the start of it, I was like, oh, TikTok, this is fun. I'm not going to write about this. That never happens. Um, the things that we that we like, we write about. The things that we hate, we write about. It's kind of the the nature of being a media studies scholar, right? Um, I did write a piece on TikTok last year um, that I'm gonna blank on the name of, which is really bad. You should know the names of the things that you write about. Um, but I wrote a piece um, for feminist media studies uh, called an ode to Zora Neale Hurston it, that is about Black feminist pleasure on TikTok. Um, and you can find it's on my website. There's a link to it there. And Black Feminist Pleasure on TikTok was about trying on a new lens for understanding what Black women were doing online that wasn't based on a capitalist model, right? So I challenged myself to move away from how the book ended and instead think about the varied reasons that Black women engage in production online and content creation online that are not about seeking sources of income. Like why, for example, would you continue to participate in a platform that you know is stealing your work? Why would you do that but for the fact that you actually like to dance, that you actually like humor, that you actually like doing makeup, right? And that that's okay. And that if we study Black women in that way, what we actually are saying is that Black women are full human beings who are not tools within a capitalist cog, they're not cogs within a capitalist state, Right? They're not, they're not these like other beings that we can't understand. They're human beings, they're full human beings who are deserving and entitled to pleasure and joy and all the pieces and components of our full humanity. And then I, I'm working on a TikTok piece right now with a student that is about disambiguating terms like appropriation and cosplay um, and how the mimicry on TikTok kind of is blurring the boundary lines between these concepts that we thought we had figured out in media studies. 
Um, so those are a couple of projects on TikTok. I'm not like on a persistent TikTok uh, writing binge right now. I'm working, I'm finishing, I, I wrote a book this summer with uh, with Andre Brock actually, and uh, a couple of other colleagues, Lisa Nakamura called Digital Optimism, which we're really excited about. And I'm finishing up a, another book project called Radical Intentionality, which is about the ethics that we bring to doing um, digital humanities work, black digital humanities work specifically. Um, and how we can start to center people in our work uh, instead of tools. Uh, so busy, busy writing, but also busy uh, cultivating this community space called BCAT. And I'm really, really excited about utilizing this lab to create community among folks who are interested broadly in the ideas of race, disability, justice, um, Black studies, and digital culture. Uh, the lab sets up a model that starts in high school and goes all the way through the professoriate to provide support networks and mentoring to reach back as we climb, as they say, um, and to provide the support structures that so many of us had to kind of cobble together um, and institutionalize them, right? Provide ways for students to actually fund their research and find mentors and have committees and meet with publishers and they don't have to figure all that stuff out on their own. So really excited about the lab's work. You know, follow us. A lot of our events will be open to the public, and we would love to have folks join us and think alongside us uh, over the next couple of years. That's so awesome. Um, do you want to tell us the release dates of the two other books just to help promo them? Well, that's up to the publishers, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> they will be out in 2023. It's just a matter of when in 2023. So if I get this last draft in by next week, um, <laughs> perhaps earlier in 2023. Uh, but yes, look out for them in 2023 for sure. If you follow me on Twitter, I believe in self-publicity. So you will awesome. hear about them going forward. <laughs> Awesome. That's great. Um, I also want to encourage folks because we still have a few minutes. If you want to type in for their questions, um, Sarah, did you have a question? Not to put you on the spot too, but while we're waiting for more questions. Um, let's see. I I suppose I'm just curious, you know, one thing I love to ask is, you know, what advice would you give to graduate students who are in, you know, the proposal writing stage or the fieldwork stage, you know? like a piece of advice that has helped you or something that you think, you know, can really help us because I'm, I'm in that stage. So it's, it's a selfish yeah. ask. <laughs> yeah, that's a great, I love that question. Um, so one thing I would always encourage graduate students to do at every level is to find your people and know that your people may not be the people at your institution um, and, and cling on to those people, right? Because uh, the people that I found in graduate school are still my dearest friends. None of them went to grad school with me, by the way. I love my cohort. <laughs> that I graduated with, but the folks whose work matters the most, whose opinion of my work matters the most, who read what I write and, and provide care in that, who understand our folks I found in grad school at various universities, um, who were, we often were placed on panels together at, at conferences and we're like, well, if we're going to keep getting put on panels together, we should probably Get to know each other and some of those folks you know you've mentioned uh have spoken and given talks at this place now right and so these are my peers these are the people who are my lifeblood in a lot of ways and the other thing that i would encourage students to do is to remain curious throughout your process to never get to a point where you think you know exactly what you're going to do and what the outcome is going to be because you're really limiting yourself in terms of what possibilities exist so get curious and take weird classes that are not on the course of study and get curious and read things by authors that are outside of the reading list and get curious at conferences and go to talks that you don't think are related to your work and challenge yourself to find the connections between what other folks are doing and your own work because it makes your literature review so much more lively. It makes the questions you ask resound with multiple audiences. It provides new methodologies that you didn't know existed so I just encourage folks to continuously remain curious as they're pursuing their scholarship. Amazing, thank you so much. That's that's really good advice, I think. I hope so, I hope it works out well. <laughs> well, thank you so much. We haven't had anyone type in any new questions and we're at 7.15, so I think it's a good place to end, especially on that very like hopeful, uplifting yes. note. <laughs> much better than the note, the, end, the note I ended on with the talk. So yeah, let's end, end with hope. <laughs> This was so wonderful. Thank you so much for coming and speaking. Thank you everyone for attending and please continue to attend our events. We're excited to have you. We have 
another nine or 10 events this semester. So we're excited to see you there. Thank you, Sarah, for doing the text. Thank you, Dalton, for doing the captions. And thank you all again for your wonderful questions. I hope you have a lovely evening. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, we